with me, I'd like to go slightly out of order. Um, the mayor has joined us as part of the administrative report out, and I would like to put her first so she can basically just say hi to everybody and then move on to her schedule. So if that's okay, mayor, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? This is my first time using this machine. So that, yeah, all right. Um, thank you, Wayne. Uh, I wanted to just sort of pop in and introduce myself to those of you who don't know me. And, you know, thank you all so much for your work. On behalf of the city and our community, hopefully you all know that sustainability and reaching and working to exceed our carbon neutrality goals, as well as working towards more renewable energy sources, not just offsetting our carbon, were, were really sort of cornerstones of my campaign and something that I talked about a lot. And um, working on these issues for the city is, is really one of the main reasons why I ran for mayor. So um, I can tell you that I'm already aggressively applying that lens, uh, which I promised to do with looking at decisions, um, you know, with the climate crisis and our goals to work or to halt it or reverse it, um, as well as to provide protections and make Northampton as resilient as possible to the impacts of it. Um, and so I've been, decisions I've already been making, um, I have been applying that lens already and it's been a very, very busy 24 days. I can't really believe it's been less than a month <laughs> since the inauguration. It feels like a very long month already. Um, but uh, I just, it was important to me to reach out to all of you and let you know how important I think the work of NASC is and how much I value your advisory role um, to me and the work of the city and, you know, to the expertise, at, you know, and the, and the really deep knowledge that you all bring to NASC. Um, I'm just incredibly grateful for it. So um, thank you. And I want to hear from you, not only on, you know, items that are coming to you for input on NASC, but please always feel free to reach out. Um, to me in my office and contact us about, you know, anything that you feel um, in this realm, you have something to add and, and can weigh in on. So that's it. I, I really thank you all for letting me pop in and take some of your time. I saw your agenda. It's a big agenda. So I won't take any more of your time, but I just wanted to um, say hi and just express my deep gratitude. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. And, and as you all know, the mayor won't be able to come to that many of your meetings, but you know, we definitely keep her in the loop. So when you're making recommendations, you know, we've been working with her and her office on thinking about how do we bring climate into capital improvements programming, both for funding things and evaluating things. So she's always with us, even when she's not physically with us. On that note, I will leave you. No, I will leave <laughs> you. Bye. Um, so I'm sorry, I should have announced, so I think Zoom did it for me that this meeting is being recorded. Um, and actually, let me also turn on the transcript. So, right, so this also should be subtitles if you want them. If they're in your way, you can turn them off, but they're there for anybody who, who wants them in the process. So as always, we start with public comment period. Um, and Alex, you raised your hand first, so you get to go first. Thank you. Um, so uh, I am no longer a member of NESC and I just wanted to pop in and say goodbye. It's been excellent working with you these past two years. Um, we do important work here. I know it sometimes can feel like it's slow and that it's um, a <clears throat> we're doing small little incremental things, um, but that's that's those small incremental things get things done. And so I uh, just want to encourage, encourage us all to, to keep, keep going. Um, and I will be uh, attending when there's things that are relevant to me. Um, feel free to reach out to me because energy and sustainability is, is something that's, you know, very important, always has been. Um, and so I, you know, want to work with any of you. Um, uh, on these issues. And now you don't have to worry about open meeting law, uh, if not that well, except for Marissa and Rachel. But um, <laughs> uh, you can reach out to me as members and we can talk about everything. Um, so I look forward to that and look forward to coming back uh, when I can. Well, thank you all. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, uh, Jackie, you're next. Yes, thank you. Uh, from time to time, I have a need, a desire to do some research on what's going on in the city. 
and I like to look at the city's video archives to, uh, for various councils, commissions, committees, and boards. Uh, but the um, energy and sustainability videos, which are which are in lieu of minutes in our city's records, are not available for the last two years. The last video of the, these meetings that was posted was February of 2020. And I've found, I've found videos going back to 2013, but um, I'm wondering right now, the records of this committee for the past two years are locked behind Wayne's YouTube account at UMass. They need to be on the city's video archives. I, I hope you can tend to that sooner rather than later. Thanks, Jackie. I just want to correct one thing so you know. It, the video is not in lieu of minutes. So we, we keep minutes, Chris Hafman's, the committee approves them at each meeting. And the minutes are, all, the minutes are up on the, um, as soon as the minutes are approved, they are put up on the city's website. So you can access I've been to the website for energy and sustainability. And there's a link that says all agendas and minutes. And I click on it and I just get the agenda, the current agenda. It, 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 may, it may be hidden. Um, um, Jackie, give me, I don't know if you can reach me out to me by email. I'll see if I can find a way to, for you to get into it. We'll, just, we'll explore it together. I don't, go on, I don't go on the city's website very often to look for it, but I know they're posted. We yeah, and the, the videos would be very, very helpful <clears throat> because they tell you a lot more than the um, than written minutes do. And Let's, it, it, Chris, this I'll may be... It. Yeah, I was going to do this update later because Jackie raised it. Um, when we when COVID first started and the city had only limited number of Zoom licenses that could accommodate over 100 people, which the planning always needs to so have large meetings, I kept my UMass account, um, but they've now set up a new account for me for the city. So this is our last meeting that's on the UMass account. So the city one will be a little bit easier for that, that reason. Going. going forward. Thank you. That's good news. Okay. Um, Adele. Thanks. I have uh, two items that I would like to bring to your attention. And the first is good news. It's, um, it's a new bill that's been filed in the legislature by Kay Kahn. It's uh, HD 4755. And um, it's a, it would require statewide all new buildings and substantially renovated buildings to uh, use only electricity for their source of power and would therefore um, prohibit fossil fuel use. And it would take effect in January of 2023. So um, as you will, most of you will recall, you endorsed two other bills a couple of months ago that would give municipalities the ability to require electricity only um, as a power source for new buildings and substantially renovated buildings. But this one would go further. This would make it a statewide law. So uh, I thought you might be interested in that and that you might want to consider endorsing that bill um, at the moment. It's a late filed bill, so therefore it's not subject to joint rule 10 day. And so therefore there's time for you all to um, submit your endorsement. Secondly, um, I just wanted to mention that I was qu quite surprised when I learned about the form-based zoning forum that the planning department is holding tonight at seven um, because I'd never heard anything about that uh, coming before this commission. And it seemed quite relevant in my mind um, that you all would have been given an opportunity to consider these changes. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Adele. Uh, Gordon. Uh, Adele, could you just repeat what that zoning board meeting is about tonight? It uh, was announced by the planning department. It's called Forum-Based Zoning Forum, Public Forum from seven to 8.30. And it's about um, some, I consider them to be pretty dramatic zoning changes for our downtown areas, uh, Florence and um, Northampton downtown areas. And, and, I'm, and Wayne, do you know anything about that? 
Yeah, this is, I think, the fourth or fifth um, public forum we've had on this in the last three years. So this is sort of, um, uh, right now, our uses, particularly in Florence, are heavy, heavily on use restrictions, but the comments we hear most from people are about design issues. So in Florence, it would be liberalizing the amount of uses allowed, um, uh, particularly allowing first floor commercial away from the, the core, the two main core intersections, uh, Maple and Chestnut, um, and adding stricter design standards. So the biggest criticism projects in Florence in recent years has been, you know, whether it's Cumberland Farms and the new building on the, the uh, southeast corner of Maple and Main um, about design issues. So this is stronger focus in design, less on use. Downtown is similar, um, greater flexibility on uses on side streets. Um, so first floor commercial, among other things, um, and less review by central business district away from the core. The, the basic premise is um, these are big districts and Florence shouldn't have the same set of rules as um, uh, Damon Road, for example. And uh, Hawley Street shouldn't have the same set of rules as Main Street. So it's, it's doing those things. Um, we've had a series of, of forums in both places, and now we have, that was sort of, we did, I don't know, three or four meetings. Marissa was on the planning board at the time, so she might remember the number, but um, we did a series of sort of listening sessions, and then this is now coming back with draft code. We haven't introduced anything yet, so we're just sort of listening at this point. Adele. The reason I'm mentioning it is because as I read the 102 page document, um, it could result in a lot more propane tanks downtown. Um, so uh, I think that this, this commission should have a role in, in that. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. What, what would those propane tanks be for? The new code would allow housing, um, multifamily housing in, uh, in places where it's not allowed right now. Therefore, could could very easily be a propane fueled. I, Adele, I just want to correct one thing. Oh, right good. now, we allow housing, multifamily housing in every inch of central business district. Um, if you're right on a street, a public street, the housing has to start 30 feet back. So you have a veneer of commercial in front. On you know, Main Street and Pleasant Street, that's been a way to allow accessible units in the first floor, but still keep the foot traffic up, which is what we want to continue to do in those core areas. On the side street, there's just not demand for retail. I mean, there's less demand for retail now than it was three years ago. But it, it wouldn't be allowing new, new um, residential. It would be not requiring that commercial facade in front. Uh, Jackie. You're muted, Jackie. Yeah, I don't want to belabor this. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, but my reading of the new ordinance says that it's going to allow first floor residential mixed with first ground floor commercial. So I don't want, it, it, it's, it's going to come up tonight. It's going to be discussed ad nauseum, but your explanation doesn't jive with what I read. I'm just saying. Yeah, so again, we already allow it right now in downtown, 30 feet back. Um, so it's really, yes, we allow first floor residential without a commercial use in certain areas. So not in the red brick buildings on Main Street, not on Main and Maple, and not on Main Pleasant, and in uh, Chestnut and Florence, but in the other areas in between. All right, so um, I'm still getting used to the new agenda format. So. The next member's item, that's just about updates from anybody, is that correct? Chris, you're muted. No, that is just to um, uh, welcome um, Marissa. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and yes, and, and, um, and say goodbye to Alex, basically, <laughs> to, to acknowledge the change on our membership. Marissa, I've obviously known you for a long time, but do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. I, first, let me say, I'm sorry, I was uh, a couple of minutes late. We've redone our home computer setup uh, for Zoom meetings and not, not all the things are talking to all the devices and things yet. And that, so I was a little delayed. Uh, 
so first of all, hi, I'm Marissa Elkins. I'm a uh, new city councilor at large uh, and am picking up the baton from Alex. Uh, and I'm very excited. I'm very excited to be here. Um, so I look forward to working with you all and learning and and seeing what we can do. Very excited. Great. Thank you, Marissa. Um, Gordon, I see your hands up. Did I miss you or did I not lower your hand after you spoke before? Oh, no, I was just going to suggest uh, that I, I support uh, Adele's suggestion that we um, would support that law uh, going through the legislature in Boston. Um, I don't know who usually takes up the charge on writing those letters of support, but, but uh, Chris, would that be you? Adele has made our life incredibly easy. What Adele's done, if we can twist her arm again, is she usually writes a draft which we then edit, so there's some editing involved, but she's doing the heaviest lifting. Okay, well, I would, I, she's would, that stuff. I would definitely support that. Adele, if you would be so kind as to do that for us, I would certainly uh, support. Do we need a motion that the, uh, that the commission would support that? Yes, could that'd we, be great. Could, could we please make that motion? Can we make that Thank motion you. right now, Wayne? It's not, it hasn't yeah, been on the agenda? Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna do it. Ed. Yeah, this is, you know, we always do late, this isn't, the okay. exception to public right to open meeting. I mean, I'm sorry to to advertising is things that come up late, and this clearly qualifies. As clearly. I would have done it late in the item at the very end under action items, but it's fine now. There's nothing wrong with that. So okay. yes, Gordon, I'm assuming that's your motion. Yes, please. Is second. somebody going to second it? Second. Second. That was, uh, Rachel. Okay, and as you all know, you haven't been through this before. In in return for being remote, we have to do roll call vote. Um, so Wayne, I vote yes. David's not on the call yet, is that correct, right? Uh, Marissa? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, Louis? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Ashley? Yes. Richard? Rich? Yes. Tim? Yes. And Ben? Yes. Okay, passage unanimously. Thank you. Um, often Adele writes these, and either Chris or I do them. I'm actually going on vacation tomorrow for a week and a half. Chris, are you okay taking Adele's letter and polishing up? Great. Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Mm -hmm. yep. Be okay. happy to provide a draft. Thanks. Thank you, Great. Adele. Thank you, Adele. So the next item on the agenda, you know, we're, we're using this new format. Um, if you remember in the format, but we had to tinker with some as we learned some things. So the language was, I think, administrative actions. We weren't always clear exactly what that meant. So we just changed the title to early NESC input into projects. So same, same basic idea, but these are the things that we want to make sure you get in on, on the ground floor in the process. So I'm going to start because we have a visitor who's interested in one item. I want to make sure we put that first so that she can go. Um, we've had discussions with you before and a series of times as we've been slowly adding to both code and policies, different energy performance requirements. Um, and so I just wanna run through quickly what we have right now and then give you the heads up on the, so some of this is what we already have, but to set the context, some of these are things that are in, po in process. So the earliest one we have is when is units that are over six units, so seven and above, in the urban residential C and urban residential B, which are basically the donut development roughly a mile from downtown and roughly half a mile from Florence, again, some exceptions. When that passed, I don't know, six years ago, we said has to, in order to get that density, you have to give us fossil fuel, heating, cooling, hot water, and how to go beyond the stretch code or give us lead gold. So that's the current center we've had for a long time. Then last year, when we add, when city council with planning board's recommendation, this committee's recommendation added bonus densities for affordable housing, half scale housing and two family housing. We said fossil fuel free construction for those buildings. Um, some conversation about, and, and the two family home, the threshold is only if it kicks in site plan approval, which is usually above 2000 square feet. So it's not gonna be all two family homes. Quick background regulatory, again, you mostly have heard this, but just as a reminder, we have a statewide building code 
It's illegal for us to have our own building code other than things like the stretch code. And we're not allowed to use the zoning as a backdoor approach to replace the building code. Mm. Our interpretation until somebody sues us in court and it's not totally clear, so we could lose, but our city solicitor supports us, um, is that when we're given voluntary bonus density, then we can require things. So when we have uses as of right, we can't do anything that should be in the building code. You know, so personally, I think we should have fossil fuel construction. We should, you know, et cetera, but we just can't do that. That's the lobbying in Boston that Adele was talking about. Um, but when we're giving extra bonus density, at least our interpretation, which we're following, is we can do extra. So that's why we can't do those things across the board. So that's what we have right now. I've come before you a couple of times. Ben came down to Springfield once for a conversation, a regional conversation about what do we do for affordable housing where we're putting dollars into it. So it's a better, you know, when we're putting money in something, we have more leverage. There's always some interpretation, right? If we're putting $10 into a million dollar project, we don't have a lot, a big seat at the table. If we're putting a million dollars into a $10 million project, we have a pretty big seat on the table. So we've had this informal policy, which this committee has opined on, on these affordable housing units. But we haven't really had something in writing and we're trying, we're getting more of these projects. We have, I think, six different projects, which are in surplus land, land that city council surplus. Um, and so we both have funding in those projects and we're giving away land. We have other projects like the nursing home uh, on Bridge Road, which is gonna ask for a million dollars in some combination of CPA and CDBG funding. You know, a million of a at a $16 million project isn't a huge percentage, but it's a lot of money. Um, but of course it's an existing building. Um, so that has some limitations. So we're just trying to think about these things of how do we switch from our policy we've already had to a specific policy. The one that came up most recently is, is Megan McDonough. If you don't know her, she's on this call, is the executive director of Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity. It's been our goal, which we've been able to achieve for 20 some odd years to give them all the land they need so they can keep, they, you know, whenever they have capacity to build, that they have land to build on. Um, and so we've been playing with this sort of policy and it's in some ways, small units are easier. In some ways they're harder. They're easier because you could actually, in many cases, have solar to, to, solve, to serve all the electricity, right? If you have a huge project with 60 units, it's hard to get solar on the roof. A single family home, you can do that. But they're harder in some things. If you're building a 800 or 1200 square foot house, you know, on a very limited budget, obviously there's, there's limits for doing it. Um, and so, you know, we've been talking with Megan about what's our minimum um, HERS rating? You know, what, you know, what kind of thing can we do? We know we can't do passive house construction for a 1200 square foot home. And, and so we're interested, and I don't claim to be an expert on this. So we know we wanna do some, the fossil fuel one is easy. We have stopped having pushback. So um, some of you, you know, we've been pushing fossil fuel construction for heating and cooling for buildings, big and small alike for a number of years, and we've been successful. We've had pushback on domestic hot water because there's such peak loads. So the lumber yard in downtown and um, 140 Olander Drive at the state hospital, they both have massive propane tanks. So they're all um, electric for heating and cooling, but they're propane for hot water. Valley CDC, who we've been talking to about this, is willing to commit to all electric for the nursing home, even though it's a 63 unit project. So I, I don't know if, to what extent, because we've been pushing them and to what extent technology is changing, I don't care. So that part, the fossil fuel free, we're there. Um, Ben's done a good job before this committee on saying, you know, net zero is great, but if it's net zero on a poorly insulated building, when you turn the heat on at midnight, you're still using fossil fuel, even if you're net zeroing out. And so that conservation is really important. So that's my setup. You know, what is it we want to ask Megan for this the immediate project is a house on, um, uh, sorry, total blanking out, a wood, uh, wood, Woodland Drive, but it's going to come up for a house we're giving them on um, at the state hospital, for two or I guess for three houses and a property we're giving them on Leeds on Evergreen for a house. So I, that's why I don't want to, I, I'd, I'd rather not do these case by case, I like to have a policy. So that's my intro. Megan, can I put you on the spot and actually have you start and sort of talk about what you think is doable and not doable and then we'll push you to go further. But 
Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, well, and we've we value energy efficiency as well. And I think it's silly to be building homes that are affordable and get someone an affordable mortgage and then they can't pay their heating bill. I think we've entirely missed the point if we do that. Um, so um, I agree that I think we're there on the fossil fuel free um, buildings for heat hot, and hot water. Um, we've been working with Adele and the local energy advocates on some ideas for um, hot water heating going um, in small spaces. Um, so that's great. Um, but when it comes to the HERS index, it's an imperfect science. Um, and so I 100% I agree with the sentiment of uh, not just sticking solar panels on an energy inefficient building, like, you know, insulate your old farmhouse before you put solar panels and mini splits in it 100%. But I think that the what we've been building are, you know, small, simple, sturdy buildings with continuous insulation. Um, so I think that that's a key factor. I think that that's something we could commit to um, that makes a big difference in the overall envelope, either continuous insulation through exterior rigid on the inside or a double stud wall. Either one, I think, is a really important metric for comfort. Um, and having, you know, we focus on simplicity and design, doing just flat ceilings with blown in cellulose and slab on grade so we can insulate the slab. Um, and I don't necessarily want to commit to a specific HERS index um, when we're getting below the numbers in the mid 40s. Um, because beyond that, it, there's this sort of ex exponential curve of cost. Um, for getting further energy improvements in the HERS index when you get without putting solar on. And there may be a time once you've built a pretty good shell, you know, with continuous insulation, you've moved to heat pumps for heating, heat pump water heating, then in balanced ventilation. I think after that, sometimes the incremental things you can do to improve the HERS index aren't worth it. And it actually does make more sense to put solar on, um, or you've reached that threshold. Great, thank you. So, uh, Ben. Um, I mean, I, it, it's probably hard for anyone to believe that I'm saying, hey, a certain amount of energy efficiency is good enough, but I actually sign on to what Megan said. I think once you're getting below a, a 40 hers rating, or you know, in that 40s range, you know, 42 or whatever, it is really hard, and um, and the additional benefits aren't competitive with with PV. In other words, you probably could make the difference with PV uh, at a lower cost, a, a higher, you know, a faster payback. However, you want to think about it. Um, so yeah, I think tying the hands of people, especially if we're making housing, which we really really need. Um, it, you know, we, I, I think the way Megan has described it is pretty good. I think that there are a lot of things that we can do with the, with specific systems that can, um, it, that can allow these houses to actually, uh, have, have more evened out, uh, demand, uh, profile on, on the electric grid. And that might be something where it would be something where we could have an influence and we might want to start essentially pushing a certain approach to using, essentially using electric hot water heating as a grid balancing mechanism. Um, and, and I can get into that if, if we want to discuss that, but, um, but rather than saying, no, 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 let's keep driving uh, an extra inch of insulation or, um, you know, better windows than what, you know, what they typically do, um, you know, it does begin to get pretty hard. Great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Gordon. Uh, yeah, I would second absolutely everything that Ben just said. Um, I think it really just to, to expand on the systems way of managing, and Megan also mentioned that we don't want to burden people who are being put in assisted housing uh, with high utility bills. And there's 
there's really a way to do that with which ultimately is a system of generation such as solar, a battery for storage and an electric system for uh, the utilities for heating and for hot water. And so I think the quest, this is something that we're gonna have to address not just for Habitat for Humanity, but for converting the entire city's population over off of uh, fossil fuels we're going to have to be figuring out a way for us to incentivize and coordinate for organizations such as Habitat for Humanity as a way of ramping ourselves up to do this for everyone in the city. Uh, we need to figure out how to install systems. I, I wonder how much work is being done with the utility companies to get them to uh, set up ways for financing uh, these projects so that uh, maybe the utility company puts up the money for uh, for the the heating systems and it's paid back through the bills uh, as a way to regulate the cost of the system. Uh, there's this is that's a pretty big topic. I'm excited that we're talking about it. But. Great, thanks, Gordon. So I want to keep us moving. Can I, because Ben's likely to push a little bit and Megan's likely to push a little bit, is there any chance I can, you know, what, what I'm looking for is a policy because sometimes things are below a threshold or I can just call it Megan and say, do you want this lot? Sometimes they're above a threshold and they have to do an RFP. So I'd like to ha have a clear policy. So, you know, the mayor gets decided about community on block grant. So it's a policy that she has. We just advised the Community Preservation Committee, but we'd like to have a policy we sent them. Ben and Megan, for the small units, would you be willing just to work together and, and give me what you seem to be agreeing on, but I'm not sure I'm taking notes fast enough, and say, here, you know, here's what it is that I can include? Okay. I always then, like working with Megan. <laughs> okay. So, Ben, I might ask double dip on you, too. I suspect there may be some things that are different for big projects and small projects. So I might ask you to do the same thing with Laura Baker at Valley CDC for big projects, but let's let's do the small ones first and then come back because it's different challenges, right? The big projects have the big opportunities. Like I'm really excited about the potential because hot water is the big challenge. And there's there are new technologies and new techniques available right now that allow you to more efficiently use systems and if you're building new i'm just going to say this and then drop it you know if you're building new you can actually lower the total installed cost because you're actually combining your hot water and your uh heating system uh and just putting up putting a lot less copper in place <laughs> okay all right so let's start with the small house project to make it you know megan's projects and then let's move on to the other things and we can i mean i, I don't want to use the committee for that but we may ask come back to you with the draft and I, I'm not lobbying Rachel and Marissa, but just so you hear this conversation, um, when we do have conversations with Valley or with uh, Pioneer Valley Habitat, we do say we understand there's some additional incremental cost and you know, make an ask to CPA or make an ask to, to CDBG. Again, not that city council has to accept that, but we do know that there may be, even though the life cycle costs may be, will be lower, I understand that, that's not the same thing as having financing to building something. So there's still a front cost, even if you're saving money over 20 years. Or 30 years. Okay, that's great. Um, the other thing that I have, I mean, I don't wanna go through too much, but I just wanna give you an update on where we are with Eversource. You all know we sort of approached Eversource, city council voted unanimously to pass an order saying, we would love to have a district heating utility in town. Um, we had a good conversation. So Eversource has, just issued a press release, I think in the last couple of days, that Framingham is their selected pilot. So that's the bad news. Northampton is not the selected pilot. Um, it's not all bad. I actually thought Adele would bring this up, but um, it took Eversource, I think two years to go through uh, Department of Public Utilities for a rate ask to say, how do we do this for district heating? It's just, it's a new thing. They know how to do gas, DPU hasn't done it. My understanding from Eversource is that there's a bill pending in the legislature, no idea if there's a chance of passing or not, that would sort of short circuit that DPU process. You still need DPU approval, but it wouldn't become a pilot. It would be saying, yes, we have a process for, for doing it going forward. 
Um, good conversation with Eversource. They gave us a shopping list of things. Again, no commitment for the next stage for, for a pilot. We don't know where they're going, but they said, first and foremost, you know, having political support is important. Having diversity, you know, they said, oddly enough, I thought, sort of thought not having a lot of big customers would be a challenge because it's easy to convince one Smith College. But they said, yeah, I see Ben's hands. They said, God forbid you have to go talk to McDonald's was the example they gave. You know, you never even get anywhere. You might get somewhere or somewhere else. So we're appealing. So they give us a shopping list of things that we, we'd like. So, you know, working with DPW on um, pavement management index, which gives us a hint of what streets are going to be, be ripping up in the next 10 years. Because I they said, I think 30% of the cost is ripping up a street if you can get it while the street's going on. And, you know, what's the use profile? What's the square footage per acre, you know, to help doing it? So I think they're taking it seriously. I will say the district heating people are clean energy advocates within Eversource. So I don't know what to what extent they have gravitas within the larger organization. But so we're, we're taking it seriously. So again, bad news in the short term, not in the long term. I don't have a specific ask for you all, but I wanna keep you in the loop. And I think as we collect information, we will be coming back. So Gordon. Oh, um, I just, I apologize for requesting to go back to the previous discussion. I just wanted to suggest that there's a huge difference between uh, 1,200 square foot single family homes and uh, mid rises downtown. Um, and so you were saying you're getting ways of writing regulations. I think you're going to really need to split it uh, for building types. Um, and if they are residential, uh, 1,200 square foot residential buildings in an open, area with full sun exposure, then we need to be looking for ways of those places being self-sufficient um, where that's not possible with, you know, mid-rise downtown in the same yeah. way. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, there's also an equity piece. You think about it, you know, if you have one person living in 1,200 square feet and some other person living in 3,000 square feet, I don't care how efficient that 3,000 square foot building is, that person's still going to have a bigger carbon footprint, you know, and so somehow that should fit into this process. Um, ben. Uh, so I noticed that Louis had his hands up, so I want to go to the, the district energy thing, but he had his hand up during the housing thing, so I just Oh, okay. To Sorry, Louis, I missed you. If, if you had something you wanted to say. Yeah, just that when we start um, sort of negotiating, I think that it's going to be the smaller the house, the harder it is to hit a specific HERS rating. Um, we're, right now we're measuring um, efficiency based on um, what the, when they first started car emissions, it was uh, parts per million of exhaust. And now they've switched it to parts per mile driven. And we're still a little bit in the parts per million of tailpipe emissions if we're allowing large buildings where like Wayne said, the 3000 square foot house with a single person in it is carrying um, a HERS rating that's um, the same as a 600 square foot house with one person or even two people living in it. So there's gonna be negotiation and um, the interactions that we've had with um, Megan McDonough have, have really worked with those. We, we, had a lot of discussion about the houses out on uh, Glendale Road um, around that. Um, and then when we get to starting with renovations, there's going to be a lot of other kinds of discussion and we're going to end up trying to find a way. It's worked pretty well so far, but we're pushing the, the bar higher and higher and higher the bar gets, the harder it's going to be to get there. And I want to squat, I don't want us to squash projects because we've set the bar too high. And, and adding to that point, Louis, I'm not trying to cut you off, Ben, but just very quickly, you know, the nursing home is a good example. So not tearing down the nursing home saves a lot of embedded energy starting over, but it also means you're stuck with, you know, thinner walls, thinner exterior walls. Uh, ben. Um, so one thing on what Louis just said, which is in the conversation that Chris, Wayne, Aiden, and I had with, uh, uh, Megan, I'm going to say more than a year ago now on this subject, what we came up with at the time was essentially a descending HERS requirement as, as, the, as the 
building got bigger, the HERS requirement got lower. Um, as, and, and we also had um, kind of a carve out for, on, in a, if you have a single person, you know, let's not make them have a, a heat pump hot water heater. A cheap electric tank will do the trick and just give them a low flow shower head and they're saving more energy than the other way. So, you know, kind of scaling the expectation by the size. So not that that was finalized, but at least that was part of that conversation. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we've made progress. We've done this sort of yeah. ad hoc stuff for a while. It's the not having it, it written. And, and, and yeah. going back to um, what TCB is building the state hospital right now. So they, again, they have a propane tank that they're, they're not using, you know, they are using fossil fuels for hot water, but that's passive house construction, which I gather is sort of the equivalent of 20 for hers. Is that a fair shortcut? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a little higher, but yeah. Okay, so you know, so yeah, absolutely. So yeah, but but you know, if it makes sense, Ben, do that chart. I, we have no problem with that. Saying you know, we're not going to do hers at a thousand square feet, and if you do whatever, but you know, think about any way you can bring that along. Yeah, um, just one thing that the city has done and, and establishes it's the hers is based on the envelope, not whether there's solar on it or not. So as technology changes, it's going to be a consistent envelope hers. Yeah, thank you. Makes sense. Um, so I just want to very quickly get back to what Wayne had started, you know, the, the, the next item, which was the, uh, the district energy system. And I, I know that it's basically was just news was uh, sit tight. There's nothing to go. Is it your opinion that the only path towards district energy is through Eversource? Um, yes and no. So the, the National Grid has their own pilot but at this point, it's only national grid gas territory, which we're not. Um, I think everybody's looking at what the opportunities are. Obviously, gas companies are looking at potentially going out of business. So they're the ones who are most desperate, sort of thinking about the future. Um, so I don't think national grid's realistic. Heat, who's the, so Heat is a nonprofit funded, I don't even know, foundation funded. They don't charge us, they don't charge utilities. So they're honest brokers. They said there are, for profit companies who are beginning to explore this space, probably not ready yet. So yes, today, not there, it may come. They said, you know, even though we don't necessarily all love utilities, the problem with a for profit company is universal access, which is required for a energy, for a utility, a investor owned utility, is not required for a for profit. So they can just jump around based on where they can make money. So there's some, so I think the answer is if we think there's a chance of, of Eversource, that's by far a better option. I suspect the world will get clearer in the next year. I mean, when we talked to Eversource and said, you know, using Main Street, we're digging up Main Street in 2025, is it too late? They were basically, no, the chances aren't great, but not too late. You know, come and talk to them in a year from now. Um, so I guess my question is, Again, we just passed a uh, municipal light plant authorization. And so do we have to <laughs> go with Eversource? We're digging up our street. Um, Egg Geo, which is the company that I kind of put you in touch with to consult on this kind of thing, did check in recently. And, you know, they, they have set things up like this for other small, smaller towns. And, you know, would it be worth our while to consult with them to, to say, well, how, how would we go about setting up a small municipal thermal plant, uh, municipal thermal utility for Main Street? Because we're digging there first and then, you know, as, as we go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly worth exploring. I mean, I think it's clear that the amount of cost just for a study to, and certainly for capital are enormous. Um, and so it just required, you know, it would require, I mean, certainly for citywide, I know you're not suggesting, it would require a commitment that would dwarf by a long shot broadband. You know, may not be true for a smaller area, but I think that's really sort of the conversation for doing it. Um, and I think we're going to go back to heat again to get a sense, because they have, I think, have a much better sense than I do of what's, what's out there in the, the process. You know, we did mention to, I mean, every source is certainly aware of the local environment. We did mention that Smith it seems to be moving towards ground source heat, you know, does that create opportunities of 
peaks that aren't at the same time. And they certainly thought it might and didn't know because Smith was available and certainly challenges of, anyway. so yes, all those things are worth looking at. Don't know the answer. Uh, Gordon. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask, so you said that a private company, if they were to set up a heat district, would only have to serve whoever it wants, but a publicly traded one has to serve everyone. Um, what would the city have to serve? Could the city serve who it wants and chooses as well with this? Uh, initially, you, you mentioned in the private sector, they would go where they want to to make money. I might uh, point out that the places they make money would be the places where we're using the most energy and therefore the city would still gain uh, from the private company pursuing that interest because they would naturally be drawn to the places where we uh, have the most to save. Um, yeah, I think those are the sort of things we'd look at, but I just want to be clear, there's a couple, I mean, you're right, that's one factor, who's using the most amount of energy, but there's other factors as well. One factor is what's the age of the pipeline, when do they have to think about replacing the pipeline, um, you know, so that's clearly part of the process. Eversource is pretty committed, I don't know if it's because of DPU or because of them, to serving environmental justice areas. So, you know, downtown, where we have a lot of public housing projects and affordable housing becomes higher in their list, that may not be a for-profit company's part. Because I mean, the other factor isn't just energy use, it's dealing with big customers is easier than dealing with little customers. Yeah, oh, it, it, it is. Um, yeah. But wouldn't we be putting in new pipe? I mean, if we're digging the ground up and putting in a district heating system, I mean, why? I, I understand that there's costs already there in the pipe itself, but you know, if we've already got the ground dug up, aren't we going to want to be replacing the vast majority of the piping anyway? And uh, because then we get an extra twenty-five or thirty or God knows how many years out of it, and it ends up being well worth it. Yeah, I mean, certainly digging up stream. That's why they want to know what's our pavement management index because. Um, that's what determines when streets get dug up. And yes, as, you know, as I say, they told us 30% of their cost is digging them up. Yeah. So, um, and, and then also, you, you know, you mentioned the cost for a study of, of whether or not it would be cost effective to do the district heat utility for the city. And I, I have to, again, say, there's so much study that we need to do to technically understand how we're going to transition the city away from fossil fuels, I have to bring up the fact that there are companies called energy service companies that do that for a living. And that even if you do a very small performance contract, you can use that small performance contract to pay for a giant study. So we could get a $2 million study done, do a $3 million EPC, and have it pay for the study at, and come out of pocket zero dollars for it and walk away with a $2 million investment grade audit. We don't need to take on a lot of debt to cover the cost of the audit and, and we could get a multi-million dollar audit done without coming out of pocket a dollar for the city. I think that we really need to seriously consider that. But Gordon, are you suggesting that specifically for um, district heating system or just more generally for cities building? For the district heating system is a great example of one of the things we can't afford to investigate whether we can afford to do it. Yeah, I can follow up with heat and ask. Again, they, they seem to know the environment better than we do. I can sort of ask, you know, what are leading communities do and, and what's involved in the process? So I'll follow up with them. Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, I don't, so you all get this, you know, you got the whole package of information. Um, Chris has shared the address for where we're updating things. This is the chart of things that, that Chris filled out first and then I was slow at adding my thing. So I sent you the update. I don't think it's worth going through this all. I just sort of want to be here for both Chris and I if there's questions and sort of the chart of things that we're currently working on. Before we, so just so you know sort of where we're going, but before we do that, I want to give Chris the same time that I had to highlight 
project that he has specifically, and then come back to this list in case it's something that we didn't talk about that people want to talk about. So, Chris. Well, first, I want to just say, I mean, the main reason for this is, is to give the Energy Commission, and it doesn't have to be at this one meeting, but it gives, gives you guys an opportunity to weigh in in advance. So I didn't put down any projects here that, were, that are currently under construction. Because if they're already going, then it's, you know, the, the horse is out of the barn already. Um, so this is really meant for you to provide input. A lot of it is what I reported last month. And so I didn't put that into the agenda. There were a few new things um, that came up. Uh, but if anybody has anything on this, if you look at the table, and I think Ben has a few items he wants to bring up, um, you know, this could be, a, if, if they're not urgent, then I think we probably want to leave them to a different meeting. But if, if you if they're um, uh, something coming up soon, then let's talk about them right away. Other than that, um, I could report back Northampton, there will be a Northampton heat pump pilot. Um, I did get a lot of information talking to a bunch of people from the DOER and from SCEC. Um, on that, uh, if you folks want to hear more about that right now, I can go through that. Um, Right now, just a kind of a heads up that it sounds like this year there will be a new stretch code that we will just automatically adopt when it goes into effect. Green communities will just um, automatically um, uh, take it on. And yet there's going to be a municipal opt-in specialized stretch code, which is going to at least define what net zero is, whether it actually drives you there or not. So it's gonna go a bit higher. Um, and that's going to be an opt-in. So this is just a heads up that that's going to be coming up, coming down the road sometime this year. And so I'm sure the Energy Commission is going to want to be pushing that, make sure that Northampton does um, does accept it. Um, yeah, those are the main, those are the two things I had. If anybody wants to hear more about the heat pump pilot, let me know. And Ben, I know, do you want to talk about a few things? I, I mean, I do want to talk about leads because that seems like you've got one thing that's on the shorter term list. Yes, leads. Yes. Yeah. So and, I know that you go ahead. And and I'd like to know what a heat pump pilot is. <laughs> sure, you got it. Okay, we will go over that. Okay. So Ben, you had asked uh, about leads. Just ask whether or not the windows. Um, the, Go ahead, why don't you ask? Well, here's, here's the systems thing that I wanna make sure is being thought about. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the old portion of the Leeds Elementary School, it has electric resistance uh, wires to deal with the ice dams. And the reason you have the ice dams is because you have heat leakage. So the air sealing and insulation in that attic is a really good idea, except that most likely beyond the very large air leaks, I mean, like really big air leaks we found when we were up there, the exhaust duct, right? So from each each classroom, there's exhaust air and there's there's ducts running through that open attic. And because it's just exhaust air, it was never insulated and never air sealed. Because like, why would you want to conserve the energy that you're just throwing away anyway? But I think that it is probably contributing significantly to the ice dams. And therefore, when you are trying to redesign your ventilation system for this portion of the school, which just explained to everybody is steam heated where the rest of the school is on high hydronic or circulating hot water system. So your options for what to do in the steam heated portion of the building is, is are much more limited. So, and all of this is stuff Chris is already working on, but my point is that it would be really good to eliminate that duct that's running through the attic or and or I guess uh, specify that uh, that duct needs to actually be sealed and insulated. If it's even if it's just um, since it's not air conditioning air, it could just be mounded with uh, uh, with insulation. Um, but that that is most likely a contributor to the ice dams. Obviously, the other one is to make sure the detail of that central portion that has the, um, uh, the the big air handler that goes into the the cafetorium or whatever that thing is right now neither in nor out and it's got wide open connection to that flat attic so if it's not specified they won't do it <laughs> and so there needs to be uh, a true air barrier encapsulating that mechanical penthouse or whatever we want to call it that ties into 
a project that you've got longer term, which was the fenestration redesign. If it were possible to eliminate that duct, just not have it running through the attic, then the fenestration redesign, which is too much window for that space anyway, it overheats all the time, it's, you know, it's more than you need. Some of that fenestration could become the intake and outlet for a ventilation system. So it would be nice when uh, making the request for designs, however, however your process works, to see if uh, incorporating a ventilation system and possibly even the, the uh, indoor portion of a VRF unit into that whole redesign of the fenestration system it seems like a good opportunity to make those things stick together. That that's my only kind of concern that we miss that we that we go in one direction, we don't get the chance to run the other one. Um, I'm I'm watching time, so you all know sort of my philosophy. I always want to. We're always going to put the early input first in the agenda because that's probably the most important thing before decisions are made. So this is great, I and mean, that's why I'm allowing us to go way over. It's important, but I think at some point it's. Ben, you probably talked to Chris directly, sort of gets more and more technical. So not trying to cut you off, but I just want to keep us on time. So Gordon. Uh, I there were just two things on on the on the list: the uh, Rocky Hill and Ice Pond uh, climate resilience landscape restorations. Wanted to see if we could see those designs. So um, at, I'll tell you where we are in the process. So. Uh, Rocky Hill, um, we completed the first phase. We spent $300,000 ripping out um, all the drainage systems to store the water on the site. We were accepted by the um, Department of Ecological Restoration for funding for the next stage. They have hired GZA. So GZA is doing a feasibility study of what are the things that we get the biggest bang for our buck from a hydrologic restoration and a climate um, uh, restoration. So we're happy to share with you that's done. They're, they're supposed to be done by June 30th. Okay, yeah, Ice, I would like Ice, to see that as as it goes. I'm really curious. Yeah. Ice Pond, we have concept drawings that GZA did for us two years ago. We were just notified by FEMA that we were receiving a grant. Um, so we can show you the concept drawings where we need a capital improvements request to be approved by council that would fund a local match. So again, happy to share those those draft plans. Okay, great, thank uh, you. Rachel. Yeah, I was just going to mention that I believe it's still a go of the solar that's going to be put on all of the elementary schools, Leeds, Ryan, at all. Let's see, Leeds, Ryan. Bridge. Uh, and Bridge, thank you. Mm -hmm. And so just, just when you were talking about um, changes to the leads in the exhaust system. I was just thinking, I hope everyone's coordinating so we're not putting solar on before we make changes, you know, decide we want bigger changes. Uh, so that, and also I'd love to hear about the, the heat uh, pilot. Heat pump, heat pump pilot. Okay, great. Okay, real quickly, I'll just mention um, uh, to, to Ben, that depends points, good points. Um, the folks doing the window fenestration, the folks doing the energy uh, recovery ventilation and air source heat pumps, and the folks doing the overall net zero analysis of LEED school are all talking to each other. And um, yeah, so I mean, I'll just sum it up that way, and we can go over details anytime you want to give me a call. Yeah. That's okay. That's it. that's all I wanted to know. Great. Okay, great. And the PV is not going to affect it, no matter what. It's it's in a in a place where it's not going to be touched anyhow. So oh, great. So yep, that's it's free and free and clear there. The heat pump pilot, I'll try to keep this as quickly as possible. Um, so this comes from the um, um, settlement agreement for the Merrimack gas explosions that happened where Eversource took over Columbia Gas's territory. Here's the little piece, here's the, here's the defining piece from that settlement order, uh, settlement. Furthermore, Eversource Gas would support the commencement of a heat pump incentive program to provide targeted outreach and enhanced electrification incentives for customers in the municipalities affected by the Northampton moratorium. Eversource Gas agrees to allocate $500,000 to DOER to administer this program. So now DOER doesn't really know exactly what 
They now have to define that. And one big question is that word municipalities, which is plural, because um, the folks I was talking to um, were thinking that East Hampton already has some special money going to it. And they thought this was probably gonna be just for Northampton, but either way, it's either gonna be Northampton or uh, Northampton working with another municipality or others nearby affecting that municipality. The $500,000 they're looking at going for three years. Um, uh, just real quickly, we seem to all be on the same page on where this really should go for. Um, uh, we can come back to this at a future meeting if you want, but in, in general, it seemed like the, the biggest um, benefit would come if we were aiming for moderate income residents, um, environmental justice communities, um, do outreach to affluent households and stuff, but don't add incentives, add the incentives to the uh, lower income folks, do some outreach to the hi uh, higher income. Um, so this kind of, we went over this kind of conversation uh, and we just seem to be hitting this uh, an agreement in both cases, in all, all of these cases. Um, there, Mass CEC was on the program. They have a couple of programs or projects out there uh, that are offering grant funds. Uh, the Empower initiative, they suggested we could go for a, I think it was a $500,000 grant. Oh, was that much? No, $150,000 grant. $150,000 towards marketing over three years and kind of match these two together. So there's really a lot of opportunity to define. Not going to be something for city municipality, municipal um, facilities. Um, uh, we have to find a way to structure it. It's probably going to need some kind of oversight, whether that's a new staff person in the city or contracting out. I don't know yet. I don't see how we could do another staff person at the moment, but um, um, so the opportunity is there. That's it in a nutshell. It has to be defined. And when we have more time, I hope the Energy Commission can help us define it. Can I ask a question to start? So this is, I gather, totally separate. Mass Save had a ground source heat pump pilot that was preference for lower income families and preference for people using propane and oil. But they're now, as of January 1st, you can get a $15,000 rebate for mass save for ground source regardless of your current energy source and regardless of your income that's a totally separate program so um yeah this would that would be separate and okay one reason one reason why oh, I, i'm sorry the other piece was we, this should actually probably go uh this pilot should probably go towards existing housing and the main reason why is the mass save program right now is going to really up their um incentives for heat pumps not just, not just geothermal, but heat pumps. Um, uh, and the stretch code coming in and the op op opportunity of a, a larger stretch code or, or more robust one um, is really going to address the new construction. That's, that's going to go a long ways towards, you know, so this is an opportunity for us to get those, um, those donut holes with the places that are, that are being missed. And it is, it's totally separate from Mass Save Program. Mass Save Program will be happening. So don't aim for where they're going. To, to be pushing their effort, you know, aim for where they're where what's being missed is an opportunity. And it should be a three-year, could be a three-year project. We should think about how can we improve awareness to everybody of all these programs out there. The mass set save is right now for people who want to do it. You know, you're one. So yes. right. Anything. So again, I'm, I'm always going to spend more time in this since we're going to be asked take us a while to learn how much time we spend on this, but I do want to keep us going. So I'm going to move us on the agenda. The next item I don't think is going to take more than a few seconds, I hope. Um, so at the last meeting, you all voted already to approve the new um, mission statement, obviously subject to the mayor being ready to introduce it to council. Um, and, but you just wanted me to do the final edits. So I, it's in your package. So I don't have any I don't think we need a lot of discussion unless we someone thinks we missed something from the guidance you gave us the last meeting. Rachel. Hi. No, I just wanted to, just a little uh, Scrivener's error. I, I think you mean um, advise, not advice in the first sentence. 
Oh, I thought I corrected that. Yes, I do. Oh, you did. Okay, thank you. No, I didn't correct it. I mean, I thought I did, but okay. <laughs> Thanks. Anything else? Okay, so um, I think what I'd like to do, if it's okay, I mean, the selecting high impact practices is incredibly important conversation, but it's also less timely than some other things. So your pleasure, do you want us to start on that or should we go through to both Tim and Ashley's report? Because I want to make sure they don't get cut off at the end. Are people okay if we go to that and then come back with the time that's left? All right. Wait, so, actually, um, wait, um, just, just one point. Uh, I think we should probably just approve the minutes just to get it done. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> um, all right, so approval of the minutes from December 16th. Uh, is someone willing to move that? So move. Uh, ben, move, second? Second. Also, second. Okay, Louis seconds. Uh, any discussion? All right, so roll call vote again. Um, Marissa? Mar Marissa was dealing with some uh, technical issues. And oh, okay. We'll be back and she may want to abstain anyway because she wasn't on the board then. So, uh, Louis? Yes. Uh, Rachel? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Ashley? Yes. Rich? Yes. Tim? Yes. Ben? Yes. And Wayne, yes. Okay, passes unanimously. Um, hey, Laura, I see you're on the call. You're certainly welcome to be here, but I think we've already gone through the energy conversation. So if you were here for that, catch up with me later. If you're here for something else, please stick around. Um, all right, so uh, you, all, you asked for a rotation schedule. So Tim is presenting today from Smith Folk, then Rich is gonna present from DPW, then either Louie or John from building, and then further out either Chris or I will be next after that when we get further down. So Tim, start with you. Okay, um, so mostly what we've been doing at Smith Folk is a lot of lighting projects, mostly because we have the free labor with the kids. So we've done parking lot lights over, we've done wall packs over, um, they the, the gym lights over. Um, but the bigger project we have coming up next summer is our window replacement in A and B building. There's 68 uh, windows that we're going to change out. And hopefully this is, um, I talked with Chris about city requirements, what they're looking for, um, passed it on to the architect. Um, so hopefully this is something we're going to do this summer, try to fit it in around the summer camps. Um, and I did, we're initially looking at trying to figure out how to get air conditioning into C building and using heat pumps and have this discussion. I think Chris is gonna to have to talk with our engineer to see how that would work, how we can bring in 10% fresh air to a classroom and, and use a heat pump in the middle of the winter. And if that's feasible, how, how that works. Um, that's kind of a project that's out there maybe a little bit further than next summer, but our big project coming up is gonna be the new windows. Okay, questions for Tim? Um, so I put into the chat a link. This may, it may be too late, it's usually too late, but um, <laughs> uh, there have been new um, analysis of quad pane windows that, uh, that was that? What, you four, four panes? Four yeah, panes. They're, they're, um, from, from Alpen. Uh, this, I, what I put in the link was a GSA study uh, at government uh, service administration or whatever it is that, you know, federal thing, um, showing that if you're doing a replacement and, you know, versus high efficiency aluminum windows versus these quad pane windows, the payback is just a few years. In, in other words, that the difference in cost, because we're talking R8 windows. And given that you have just about no other opportunity on these buildings besides air leakage reduction, um, you know, the windows is your big opportunity. If it's possible, <laughs> look at them anyway. Yeah, it, I, it may be a little, uh, they're, they're, they're three pane windows going in. And right now- Which these, is great. There's three operable sections, which I never understood why they would put it on there because you can't even reach the top one and they all leak. So we're gonna reduce the two top sections and just make it one, one 
just make it class and, and you can't open it. So, um, but I think actually everything is going to get advertised starts tomorrow, I think. So. Oh, well, okay. So it's too late. Yeah. Um, for future things, it, it, this is new stuff. So whatever. Yeah. Um, but try pain is great. <laughs> Gordon. Uh, yeah, I, Tim, I, I appreciate hearing what projects you guys are doing. I'm kind of interested in how you see uh, the what is being taught at Smith Vogue evolving around emerging um, trades that will have to do with our electrification of all of our utility systems and vehicles. Um, so I think that there's so much opportunity for Smith Vogue to be training the next generation now on all of these uh, jobs that are going to be really crucial for for us to to have people here in Northampton that know how to to be putting in heat pumps and all that. So how do you see yeah. the the classroom evolving over there? So you know I really have no impact on on what the teacher curriculum are. Uh, but I did talk, so there is a renewable energy course that is taught out of the science department. So that captures every, every junior on campus goes through that. And then each shop, whether it's the electric, electrical shop or the plumbing shop would focus on their particular trade. Um, electrical shop does, you know, the photovoltaic, they have, they have a, a course, a portion of the course on there. They do some production. Um, they have a little mock-up uh, generator up there. A plumbing shop has a, um, a, uh, a panel up on the roof. Um, so I, I think they're all looking at what, whatever is coming up newest and, and, and is emerging is what they want to teach the kids so that they're ready to go out into the, the job site and, and not be, you know, have a little bit of information on, on what's out there. So. I wonder, do you guys have engineering classes that yep. do, do you guys participate in you know, we're talking about how many studies we need for the city to really start to figure out um how we're going to manage this transition and, and there's things like and, and i would think that the the agricultural bent to smith voke is so useful in this we we need to get an enormous amount of land surveying done so that we really understand what our resources are for uh, space for putting in PV, for putting in pollinator cor corridors, uh, you know, what other forms of energy are available, maybe wind somewhere within the city. Um, and I wonder what opportunities are kind of being explored there. Uh, of like what opportunities that those needs of the cities could present to the students at Smith Vogue to kind of get their get their feet on the ground out there looking at stuff in the community. Yeah, I don't think that would be an agricultural department issue. I think that would go back to the science department um, mm -hmm. in, in their renewable energy course, um, if they could do that. The, the shops are really governed by what they can teach uh, through the through the state, there's there's a, a laundry list of things they can teach, but they can't go outside of that. So I'm not sure what what shop would have that. I don't think that would be in any of the shops actually. Maybe an engineering class where you study. Yep, Def definitely. There's two engineering classes that you, they could look at that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, just just ideas. I think it, Smith Folk is such an incredible resource for the community. Yep, it um, is. And so it's, it's fantastic having that opportunity to teach the students and, and for the city to benefit from it as well. Yeah. Thank you, appreciate it. You're welcome. Any last questions for Tim? Okay, Ashley, you drew the short straw for commissioner report. So you're up. I did, I did. Well, I'm actually really excited for this opportunity. I think that DEP has a lot of programming and a lot of knowledge and a lot of connections that are relevant to this commission. So I think it'll be cool to be able to level set and get everyone kind of up to speed on all of the things that DEP does. And then um, I want to talk about some of the more innovative decarbonization projects we're running that we might be able to learn from. Yeah, I, I just have a paper. 
Will you spell out CET for those? Center who... for Eco Technology. Thank you. <laughs> we we all we often go by CET. And I usually yeah. default to that. Um, yeah, I do. Uh, Wayne have just like a page of notes that I thought I would share, um, so people can follow along as I talk. Give me one second. Um... In lieu of a pretty PowerPoint presentation. Okay. You should be all set with your unpretty PowerPoint presentation. If I can find it. Here we go. Um, so it disappeared. Uh, oh, I see it's there. Is that size okay? Yeah, that's great. I want to start by just giving an overview of all of the um, sort of the main programming and services that CET provides. Um, in a sentence, we help people and businesses save energy and reduce waste. So our kind of two major thematic areas are in waste reduction and then energy efficiency and electrification. So on the waste side of things, one of our largest contracts is with the Mass DEP. We designed and administer the Recycling Works program. This is a really cool program that's pretty unique to Massachusetts, where any business or institution in the state has access to pre technical assistance to help with their waste management. So we work with hundreds of businesses every year on everything from helping them set up a cardboard recycling program to businesses that are at the other end of the spectrum that are trying to go, you know, zero waste and are just kind of chipping away at the margins. We also own and operate the largest recovered building material store in New England called Eco Building Bargains. Hopefully you've all been there. It's in Springfield. Um, I think of it as a Home Depot of used building materials. It's a really fun place to shop. And just in the last couple of months, we've lost, we've launched online um, shopping. So you can see um, almost all of this store's inventory online at this point and shop at your computer. We also offer virtual shopping tours. So we've got someone that'll go around with their, their camera and show you all, all of our products. And then we have curbside pickup if you don't want to go inside. And then we also have um, an increasingly large footprint with our Wasted Food Solutions Program. We're working with states across the country, um, primarily helping commercial businesses um, reduce food waste through prevention, donation, and diversion programming. So we'll do everything from advise kind of city and state level governments on policy and infrastructure planning to kind of set up the landscape. For, for a robust kind of wasted food diversion system. And then we work directly with businesses to help them set up those programs. And then on the energy side of things, um, we're um, mostly working in Massachusetts, although do do some work in states um, in the Northeast. But here in Massachusetts, we are vendors in the MassSafe program, um, primarily commercial. So I've got a table here showing the um, IOUs that we serve, Eversource, Berkshire Gas, Liberty, and Cape Light, doing um, commercial and, and industrial kind of audits um, for them. And then for Berkshire Gas, we also um, run the residential program. We really specialize in serving small businesses and in getting weatherization projects to move forward. Uh, we're doing a big pilot now with um, the DOER and a bunch of the utilities shown here to help innovate um, the weatherization program for small businesses. It's kind of chronically underserved sector um, and, and one with a, with a lot of need and a lot of big opportunity. And then here to my heart where a lot of my work is focused is with our municipal light plants. So we administer the residential energy programs for the Massachusetts Municipal Wholesale Electric Company, MWEC, much easier said, um, member municipal light plants. So there are 20 or so members in that network. And then we also um, provide 
uh, energy programming for Westfield Gas and Electric, which operates independently. And then finally, as part of my like broad sort of overview, we um, we have a high performance building team that provides FERS ratings and advises architects and contractors and, and building owners on passive house and lead certification design. And um, I know has been working a bit with Habitat and Adele on identifying um, hot water heating systems for small spaces. We, we do specialize in um, exercises in residential and multifamily buildings. I want to turn to some specifics. I mentioned that the um, the municipal light plant work is is dear to my heart and um, it's because we're working with some really uh, progressive MLPs right now. And the thing about the MLPs is that on the one hand, they're not regulated the same way as the same way that the IOUs are. So they're not held to the same um, decarbonization um, standards and and so forth. But for the, the MLPs in the network who are in communities that have very aggressive goals, they're really um, kind of out ahead of mass save and doing things above and beyond what we're seeing in that program. So they're a lot of fun to work with. Um, Ipswich is one example of these um, towns. They have the municipal light plant and they weren't satisfied with the residential energy program that was offered through MWEC. It's a very much watered down version of Mass Save. So for them, we developed um, the state's first whole home decarbonization program. They call it resource. We're looking at every sort of aspect of the home from the building envelope and mechanicals, but also water. Um, we're looking at outdoor yard equipment. We're advising on um, solar potential. Like I said, water conservation in and outside the home, um, uh, sustainable landscaping, kind of the whole kind of comprehensive thing and, and focusing on um, measures that reduce carbon. Um, very, very cool feasibility study we have going on right now that I've been thinking about how we could um, deploy in Northampton, potentially through our impending CCA is tariffed on bill financing. And we're doing this feasibility study with um, support from MassDEC and for the town of Ipswich. And what's neat about this financing mechanism is that unlike on bill financing, which is basically just a loan to a homeowner or building owner, and therefore, since it's a loan, they need to have you know, a strong credit history, they have to have an appetite for debt, they have to think they're gonna be, you know, in their building long enough to, to, you know, for the investment to make sense, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Tariffed on bill, instead of being attached to a person, is tied to the meter. And it's not a loan, it's the utility investing in the measures and then recovering their investment through a tariff that lasts as long as it takes to recover the investment. And one of the key principles of TOB, as, it, as it's referred, um, is that you guarantee that the tariff over the course of a year, what you pay in your tariff is less than or equal to um, the savings that you enjoy as a result of this measure going in. So if we're talking about you know, weatherizing a, a home, whatever they're paying on the monthly um, tariff to pay that off has to be less than or equal to the savings that that are incurred and similarly with like heat pump installations. But what's really cool is that besides unlocking you know access to these energy technologies for renters, low-income households, and really anyone who doesn't want to spend their disposable income on green tech, um, utilities have really long investment time horizons and they have really they have access to really cheap capital. So they're able to make really long-term loans. So you can basically extend the payback over close to the entire life of the measure, which again, brings down your monthly tariff and makes these measures really affordable. So I'm sort of doing the modeling now to figure out which measures we could finance with TOB. And it's, it's looking really good for, um, for heat pump systems in a lot of cases, like a whole home heat pump system, certainly weatherization, um, solar panels, batteries, um, you name it. I think there's a lot of potential. And 
it really changes the conversation instead of handing a homeowner a an audit report with a whole bunch of recommendations that are going to cost them tens of thousands of dollars instead it's hey we want to make this investment in making your home more comfortable and worth more and we'll save you money every month want to sign up it's like a completely different conversation i could go on forever about this i'm very excited about this project um, another cool project that we, we just got funding for is to um, move mwep utility incentives from what they are now to being fully um, based on um, or like derived from carbon savings. And so basically what we're doing is figuring out the net um, carbon savings associated with any measure that they would incentivize, whether it's weatherization or an energy star appliance or a heat pump. Um, and then setting a carbon price. So whether you say I'm going to, I'm willing to pay five dollars a ton for carbon, a hundred dollars a ton, three hundred dollars a ton, you set that carbon price, and then that derives what your incentive should be. So this gives you nice internal consistency among your incentives, sends you know the right market signals that align with our state um, you know policy goals, and it also allows the utility to compare. Um, the cost of achieving carbon reductions through these incentives and deploying these measures versus other options they have for reducing carbon. Another um, relevant one, especially with what um, Chris mentioned about uh, the heat pump pilot in Northampton, we run a uh, heat pump consultation program for all of the for customers of the MWEC. Uh, light plants. Um, so it's a lot of handholding for the customers to make sure that they get fitted with systems that are optimally sized and configured. You know, we, the way we see it, they're, they're early adopters. We need them to be really positive ambassadors for the technology and, you know, really happy with, with the systems that they get in terms of their, their comfort and the, their bills. So the program involves just initial consultations with the customers, helping them understand the technology, you know, assuring them that they work in cold climates and really just sort of meeting them where they are and giving them the information they need. And then a really key step is the contractor design review. So we'll review any designs and quotes that they get come from contractors to ensure that they're properly sized. We go in and do the energy load calculations for the home and then use that as the basis for our review. And as part of this program, we have a preferred contractor list and we're building up this pool. So really, we're kind of trying to get, make sure that homeowners end up with optimal systems, but at the same time, kind of elevating the statewide competency of contractors. So they opt into working with us in this program, sharing information, taking feedback, and you know the idea is that over time, you know, if they're giving us like designs initially that are like way oversized or not properly configured, over time we're eventually getting designs from them that are that that are you know exactly what we would have advised. And then finally, we have a um, new campaign that we're launching to build awareness around induction stove. So we're motivated by both the you know our interest in electrifying buildings and homes and knowing that the stove is, is sometimes the hardest thing for people to give up. Um, and also the public health impacts of gas stoves and the kind of toxic indoor um, air quality impacts and particularly links to childhood asthma. Um, so we're working with a couple of utilities um, and the libraries in those towns. They're going to host lending programs where people can borrow uh, induction stove kit so they can borrow like a countertop burner and pots and pans and try it out for a couple weeks um, and we're developing a bunch of awareness raising materials and we'll be including um, information in audit reports for all of the MWEC MLPs. The, ML the MLPs are also rolling out incentives for stoves that range from $500 to $750 so helping them Kind of bring them back down to sort of cost competitive with an electric or gas radiant electric or gas stove. Um, so that we're hoping to get all of that launched in about a month. Um, and I'll pause there. That's what I've got.
those questions. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, Gordon, do you have a question or comment? Oh, yeah. I was so curious about the uh, tariffed on bill financing for through the utility companies in that study. What phase are you in? Are you you're doing like, uh, yeah, can you just talk more a little sure, bit? Sure, yeah. So, so um, CDT is doing the analysis around which measures could be financed with TOB, and we're running like sort of a sensitivity analysis around. Um, you know, the co cost of the equipment, cost of, like different fuels, if you're switching from like oil to electric or gas to electric um, and sort of abiding by that principle of ensuring that the tariff is gonna be less than or equal to the savings. So that's our piece. And then we, um, in partnership with Ipswich, subcontracted two other partners on this study one is doing um, is surveying um, utility customers to gauge their kind of interest and like their like potential uptake of a program like this. And then there's another um, firm, it's the Collins Center out of um, out of BU um, who are doing sort of the the business case analysis from the perspective of the utility. And they're also looking into the legal um, requirements. The reason we sort of brought this to an MLP partner is because they can very easily add tariffs to their bills. They, they don't have to go through the same kind of new regulatory process that the IOUs would. So the MLPs are a really nice place to kind of roll this out and demonstrate the mechanism in Massachusetts with the hope that it could, it, it could scale up elsewhere. But so, uh, in terms of where we're at, we're pretty much, uh, we're finalizing, we're completing our sort of, um, our analysis now um, and the social, um, or like the uptake survey is also going to be finishing up in the next couple of weeks. And the third partner, um, also probably another month or so. So for ease of use for the utility company, are you coming up with like a kind of like a canned savings estimate per measure yeah, really in comparison? Has to be tailored. Our analysis is, is just like a litmus test is how I describe it. So we're... Uh -huh. We're basically, we've defined three like characteristic homes in Ipswich. We've, yeah, we've defined an apartment, we've defined a small to medium sized home and a large home. And then we're sort of running the analysis on those three archetypes. But okay. in reality, if, if, if we were to implement the TOB program, we'd go in as, as the energy auditors and really very specifically spec the house, we would then have to get exact costs for what the measure is, whether it's, you know, weatherization or, or heat pumps. And then we would have to look at that cost compared to historical energy bills and so forth to make sure that whatever kind of package or contract we're offering the customer really is going to um, save them money and, um, yeah, they were not like saddling them with a monthly tariff that sort of blows their 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 bill up. Okay, that's a, that's that's amazing to hear that there's planning being done for that to be applied to the individual because that's exactly how an ESPC or a UESC works, but on a much larger scale for like a city or for a public housing authority, you do exactly the same process. It's really cool to hear that they're going to do that for individual homeowners. Yeah, and renters, which is. Yeah, can you super... talk more about that? The renter part? I wasn't quite sure. So, how yeah, I mean, you'd would of a renter have to get... make that happen? Yeah, I mean, if you're doing something in the building, you obviously need the landlord sort of nodding and on board. But the point is that, um, you know, Multifamily buildings are notoriously difficult to serve because landlords seldom have the incentive to make the investments because they're not paying the utility bills. Typically, the renter pays the utility bill, but the renter has no incentive to invest in 
a new heating system or weatherization because they don't own the building. Why would they put equity into it? And they typically don't plan to be there for very long. Right. And so with TOB, that if you if if the renter leaves, it's the 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 tariff is tied to the meter. So whoever's paying the meter at the time pays that, and you've guaranteed like you've raised the value of that apartment. You've made it more attractive because the cost of operating is lower and it's more comfortable. Um, and you build into your program costs the like the the fact that there would be missed months here and there if there's like a vacancy. But the, the tariff just picks up when the rate payer comes back and just continues until the utilities recover their costs. Chris. Ashley, I tell you, you are doing everything I want Mass Save to do. You're doing PACE financing. Um, we're always preparing for yeah, it. Yeah, we are the reviewer. We're the statewide reviewer of um, PACE projects. Um, so that's another area of knowledge and Excellent. expertise that we have, yeah. My question is, will your studies be available, broadly available? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that was um, sort of part of the, the funding um, from Mass CEC is that we would like disseminate the result and that we're highly motivated to do that. So, yeah. Okay. And then last thing I'll mention is um, I wonder if you're going to run into it. Is anybody looking at uh, for rental units? Um, what the opportunity is to actually get there, get in there and do the work, which I think is a big um, barrier for landlords is you've got people in the building hard to, so unless it's a centralized system. Um, oh, so. you mean if the renters don't want you in there? Yeah. Yeah. When, when, yeah, when it doesn't solve that, that issue. Yeah. But anyhow, fantastic. It's I yeah. can see why you're excited. That's really fun. Yeah. Actually, can I, my own question is, I am sort of intrigued by this mass say $15,000 rebate for heat Oh, pumps. I did want to touch on that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so our, our understanding is um, from everything where, what one of my colleagues has been on these utility calls all week, the gas incentives haven't been decided yet. The, the next three-year plan is still held up with the DPU and it, the controversy from my sort of Third hand information is around what the um, the cost, social cost of carbon has been set at. Um, apparently, the cost was sort of higher than has been used anywhere else, and it was it is what enabled the cost effectiveness um, calculation to work for gas to electric um, conversions and. I think there's just some some back and forth with the DPU about whether or not they'll they'll sort of sign off on that social cost of carbon. So the electric incentives have been set, which means for people that have delivered fuel but are saved but are served by an electric IOU, they are eligible for a fifteen thousand um, dollar incentive for a ground source heat pump or a ten thousand dollar incentive for whole home heat pump, and then I think. The latest is 1250 a ton for heat pumps, but that's only delivered fuels and we don't yet know if or what they'll pay in incentives for gas. Mass Save um, has changed their rebate site. So you you may be right, but when I, I'm Yeah, it's up on the, right I now. downloaded the um, the rebate form today. Um, and it's it's dated 22 to 24, but you can see none of the gas utilities are on there, like Berkshire gas. And if you go to like fill out the form, you have to say that you either have oil or propane. Um, gas is not an option on that on that um, large um, rebate. And that's just because they haven't been decided. Okay. Any other questions for Ashley? All right, so last two things is, February date and then going back to whatever time is left is going back to what we need to spend a lot of time on is, is high impact practices. So the February meeting, our normal meeting is school break. And I, I'm going to be away. You obviously are welcome to meet without me, but I don't know if other people have that conflict. So do we want to stick with Thursday the 24th and then 
somebody else can share, or do you want to find a different date? I, I don't know how many of you are affected by public school breaks. So Wayne, wouldn't the Energy Commission normally meet on the 17th? Is that the school break? No, I have the 24th in the calendar. Is the 17th? Okay. Are we the third? Aren't we fourth Thursday? Yeah, we're fourth Thursday. We are the fourth Thursday? The fourth Thursday is what we've been meeting. 17, and which is the school break. That's if you want to switch to third, third, I mean, this isn't about me. So yeah. third Thursday happens to work for me, but I don't know. Yeah, Rachel. Yeah, I prefer not to meet on the same night we have council, though. It's just right, a very right. long evening. I think that's exactly why we got to four okay, Thursdays probably. for that reason. Yeah. So it, I mean, if nobody else has the conflict on the 24th, I would say just stick with that day. Um, that's not only really easy. Is that, do, do you want to just stick with that? Okay, so we'll stick with the 24th and then... Chris, I don't know if David will still be here or a new person, but, <laughs> but, but you know, that, that's a separate thing. thing. Um, right, just one quick logistics. So you also, I, I dropped the meeting. So because I, I mentioned before, we're, I'm no longer using my UMass Zoom account. I'm switching to the city. So um, I dropped, it, while this meeting, I dropped all the Zoom links going forward. So we're resend it out to you with the new Zoom links, but the 20, the, me on the 24th, we have to come from somebody else because I won't be here. So, we'll be able to use right. my again. so Chris, I'll work with you on the details for, for that piece. Um, okay, so I know we have less time than I would like 15 minutes for high impact practices, but I think we just sort of start working and going through this process. Um, Chris asked if I could do a spreadsheet that was sort of the, the plan itself with all the items. And I started doing that and realizing Either it's a shortcut that doesn't cover what's in the plan, um, or it's you know just duplicating the plan. So my inclination is we should just go through the plan page by page, and say what are the things that are most important that that we think are high impact practices and prioritize that because that plan doesn't really prioritize. It does in some ways, um, and then move forward for, from that piece. There's two sets on here. There is um, a series of actions about uh, regeneration and mitigation and a series about resilience. And I would just do it in the order that's in the, the plan and go through there. So is that okay? Can we just do page by page and get people to opine on priorities? And then we go back and make sense of it. You know, what, you know there may be some conflicts, but we're doing it. Can you zoom in a bit? I can, yeah. Is that too much? Maybe Does that work? Much. Okay. All right. So the first set is just the cross-cutting things. Chris, you're gonna say something? When you get down to the action items, I'm just gonna say there are there are a couple of broad ones in there. I, I don't have my notes with me which ones um, that have to do with outreach. And yeah. if we're doing a if we have a chance to do a pilot, heat pump pilot, um, and that becomes something that is imminent then I'd say that rises high on the, on the priority. Okay. List. So this first one is in some ways the most important and in some ways the most amorphous in the plans. So this may, we may want to have some discussion. So this is what many of you keep coming back to saying, you know, we can't put climate change in a box. It has to be cross-cutting what every department does. So this says that, but of course, because we don't control the school, you know, departments like central services and planning and the people who represent at this table, have the most involvement with this. Other departments have less involvement. So the first one is just sort of integrate the stuff into everybody budgets. And you know, you heard the mayor up front saying that's a role she's planning to do in the budget, and certainly it's a role she's already thinking about in the capital improvements budget. Um, so what's the? But I'm just trying to, today maybe the pilot for how we go through this and spend more time in the next meeting, but. What's the best way to do it? Do I just scroll and stop for conversation for each one or how does this work for you all? Gordon. Do you have this in sort of like a list of, I guess when I think like uh, high impact practices, I'm like, 
in my brain, I'm looking for some kind of a list of the things, maybe, um, I, I don't know, is that in here anywhere? I guess when I saw this section in the, in the agenda, I was thinking of the, the list of things that we're working on or the things that we're tracking. Um, so this is a little bit different than I had imagined this section. You don't, there isn't like a list of, of things within this. There's, there's not a list. That's what Chris had suggested. But the problem is when I started doing it, it just seemed like it wasn't very informative. And so it wouldn't really, it wouldn't really inform the process. I mean, it'd be easy enough just to take these titles for each thing and put it on the list. Some of them are more useful than others. So I, again, I'm happy to assign that to an intern. I, no, I don't have a list right now. Easy enough to assign to an intern if, if you all think that's the way to do it. Do we want to start a list based on this conversation then? Is that the purpose of this conversation to then? That's exactly go, right. I was thinking we go through each one list. and say, you know, red, okay. yellow, green in terms of priorities, and then we can come back and prioritize them. But again, I'm open to anything. Okay, that seems reasonable to me. Details. I mean, the advantage of a list, even though it doesn't have enough detail, is it gives you an overview. So you can start picking where you think you might be interested, and then you dive in. Yeah, I'm, I think anything's fine. It's not a lot of work for an intern. Plus, mm -hmm. that's why God meant an intern. So. Right. All right. So I don't have that for today, but I could definitely yep. ask the intern we have to, to start doing. All right. So this one, you know, and, and so the, the next, so the first one was sort of the overall outreach sort of integrating everything which again i've heard you say over and again it's most important but we just need to put flesh in those bones at some point so I, I i think we've already heard you all saying in the past this is high impact but what does that actually mean the next one is the regional entity so this is sort of you know chris and i have been reporting back about the forming of first the cca that's regional and then we hope a joint powers entity that takes that in greater detail so we're already pretty far along so we're hoping that's a good piece but just so you all know, we know what a CCA looks like. The joint powers entity is still a lot of things to be defined. Um, and I have to give my own personal frustrations. I'm not speaking for anybody else, but I, I love the idea of regional entities, but we've been talking to Pelham and Amherst for three years and something we probably could have done, launched the CCA in two months on our own. Um, and so it's the, you know, I keep using the line of, you know, don't let the the perfect be the enemy of the good. So what does make sense regionally? What makes sense locally? Um, we're doing it. And if I had known three years ago, how long it would take, I never would have wanted to be part of this, but of course I don't want to pull the plug. It's been a great committee. I, it's been a criticism. I mean, it's been a great committee, but it's been slow. So any I, comments on I this? Think, I think that anyone who's worked on regional energy plans knows that uh, when you have multiple jurisdictions of authority, it really slows a project's execution down very significantly. In fact, energy service companies uh, have almost never in their history managed to execute projects under multiple jurisdictions. Yeah. Um, so ownership of land is really critical and ownership of assets in order for uh, anyone to sign a contract and thus um i think that we're going to have to go this we're gonna to have to plan to go this on our own and join amherst and everyone else if it's possible but we need to we need to get moving yeah that's a good point i mean i think frankly we were on a high after valley bike is northampton said we'd run it who wants to sign in so we just did all the heavy lifting um and this was trying to be more collaborative which philosophically i believe in but Everything you said, Gordon, is true. It's just really hard to make it work. Uh, ben. I, I kind of want to second that that direction. It, you know, move fast. In this case, there is no physical infrastructure that requires the coordination of different communities, right? You, usually, if you want transmission, right, the big challenge with building transmission is you're crossing all these jurisdictions in some straight line. But here, it, yeah, sure, you might aggregate a larger group and therefore you get more market power or something, but right now you got zero. <laughs> and so I would say this might be a, a, a sunk costs fallacy problem where it's frustrating that you put all your effort in, but at some point, if you could do this in two months, let's just do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's the, it is, I have to say, I mean, I think Amherst's perspective and Northampton's perspective are probably very similar, but our governance structures are totally different. And that's really that culture has been slower than the philosophy. Like East Hampton probably has a somewhat different philosophy than we do, but they have a similar governance structure. 
So, you know, in some ways they'd be a better partner. But then, as you said, Ben, it's a sunk cost. We think we're within a month of signing the CCA memorandum of agreement. So, you know, maybe it's that we should go forward in the CCA because we're almost there and the joint powers entity, maybe not so quickly. But Chris, you've been involved with this as long as I have. What do you think? Well, I, I mean, when this first came to my, uh, came to my attention, I was one of probably the most skeptical of, of all of us. And I only went through because I didn't have to do the work. Someone else said they would. But <laughs> where we are now is we really are very close to signing the CCA. We've, we've, we have, we have um, got a proposal, a fantastic proposal from a good group. And the memorandum of, of agreement is about to be signed. It's really close. Um, and then put it in context, if that's plunked inside the joint powers entity, which has been the biggest slow, that's a piece of slow to sell. But if we get there and the CCA is a piece of that, you can do what you can with the CCA. But that joint powers entity, maybe it's going to be the place that allows us to do the kind of things that Ashley was just talking about. Um, so and the hope is it's going to be a, it's going to be a joint opportunity between three communities to identify ways to drive down greenhouse gas emissions in a more regional level. So we've put the effort in, it's not time to bail on it at the moment. And that's my opinion. Gordon? I, I would completely agree. It's, there's no need to bail, but um, and, and there's always a benefit to working with our neighbors, uh, but as far as taking responsibility for what we're achieving here in the city, I think we have to be careful um, not to throw our responsibility into the communal bin, but to, to really hold ourselves responsible for, for making some progress on uh, renewable and resilient energy supply, which we don't have um, at all. Uh, I wonder, is part of the region for working with these other communities uh, in theory to exert greater leverage over the utility companies? Is there an advantage there at all? Uh, or, or are we just making that up? Actually, that kind of relates to what Ashley is doing. Ashley, you might have some insight on that. Do we have greater leverage on the utility companies as kind of a joint community as opposed to just the city of Northampton? Remember, we have two different Great utilities, discussion. two different districts. Um, it certainly has a political piece. I mean, I think the legislative, I mean, you know, we, we did get a special grant that Amherst led to support this. So there's certainly a political statement that it makes. But Ashley, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure specifically sort of what sort of kind of leverage you're thinking of. Um, well, one so... So, so if we're talking about energy generation, we're looking at like gross amount of square acres available between all of our communities to feed energy from renewable sources onto the grid. And then the utility company's ability to manage that energy on a larger scale. And can we come to the utility company as a, as a larger community having maybe double or tripled between us the available space that we have to do large scale solar PV arrays uh, and say, look, we can, we can provide you with X amount of acres of solar installations. We want to make sure that you are then providing us with the utility services to get this to the end users. And then yes. uh, are, can we get them to give us incentives to install um, batteries and stuff? Ben, you're shaking your head. What are you thinking? Different load zones. <laughs> They're on different load zones. So we, we don't get any, joining up with Amherst gets us nothing in terms of, of like, here's some land over in Northampton. Uh, it, it doesn't help. So, okay. I'll say that the, the hope was at the very beginning when we were approached by residents with this idea. And CCAs traditionally in Massachusetts have been used to just buy cheaper electricity or possibly buy green power, green, green electricity. But the hope was that you could use that collective power, the, the collective um, money coming in from, from everybody's electricity bills to start to pay for local renewables. 
in local load um, reduction, um, perhaps even local electric vehicle. There is that in the time that we've been talking about this, the DPU, which has to approve the plans, has been approving less and less creative plans. They've been pushing back upon it, which we actually think is really wrong because this is supposed to be an opportunity for us to buy power from where we want to. Community choice aggregation, choice aggregation. The DPU seems to think they are the one that has the ability to give us a choice. So in the end, I think the DPU is going to limit what we can do with it. And thus the JPA, the Joint Powers Agreement and the Joint Powers Entity that we're forming, we're hoping we're gonna be able to use that to try to be creative on a regional level, which is, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. But and, and, the CCA, it's the DPU that's going to be the um, is going to be the the tunnel that you know the filter we have to go through, unfortunately. And, and I just want to elaborate on this, this conversation. I, you know, the CCA is so close; it's absolutely going to happen. I'm not worried about that piece. I'm not 100 percent sure about Pelham, but I probably Pelham's part, but they're tiny. The the real question is the joint powers entity, and I, I think you've heard sort of Chris did a good job of summarizing the pluses and minuses is potentially a much more powerful tool that helps us, but we also could be spending a lot of hours and not have it be successful. And so that's the area that's less clear to me about doing it. And it may become clear as we have a CCA and see what works and doesn't work. Gordon, is your hand up from before? Did you- Yeah, no, I, I raised it again. Um, so I guess I'm a little bit Confused. So, Chris, you said that it gives us a little bit. I'm kind of looking for for why we're why this is to our advantage, but also want to bring us back to the uh, original discussion here, which I think was on um, you know producing renewable energy and making our grid more resilient. Right? Like, isn't the long term need for our community to be uh, securing a stable and resilient power supply. Isn't that really the basis of what we need to be looking at doing in the face of, of climate change and of the evolving um, technology shift that we're seeing away from fossil fuels? We don't have currently a sufficient supply of electricity to feed the new system. So we have the top, top down existing utility system where it's mostly fossil fuel driven. Uh, the legislature in their infinite wisdom thought that we were already going to have wind power coming from Cape Wind by now that proved to be incorrect. So right now the city of Northampton depends upon the utility companies to feed it energy from fossil fuels in large part. So even if we electrify all of our buildings and all of our vehicles, we're gonna be charging those electric vehicles with fossil fuels. So, it makes it an utterly useless exercise to do all of that work until we really start figuring out how do we generate enough energy for us to use based on renewables. Dan. I, I disagree. So the electrical grid is managed at the level of ISO New England. It's an entire New England grid. The different utilities basically participate in the day ahead market and, and an hourly market for electricity. It is not always predominantly fossil fuels. There are times when it's actually majority renewables. Um, and if you're gonna count nuclear power, which I do, you, you can have a lot more times when it's uh, carbon free. We have a lot of big projects coming on. That Cape Wind or whatever, you know, the the, uh, the, the other uh, offshore wind power projects are going to be a major input. Transmission is, a, in other words, this is at a much a scale much larger than Northampton. So, I mean, we're never going to provide enough PV to do the job. 
But what we can do is participate in the electricity market either by if we have access to meter data on all, of, all the customers, which I think the CCA would get us, then we can develop practices uh, the outreach programs and so forth to actually reach users and help manage the loads. Um, we can, I think, with, if, if we're per doing uh, these purchase agreements, we can, uh, within our own load zone, have batteries, for example, where we can do arbitrage, purchase, uh, buy, uh, buy low and sell, sell it at times of high uh, cost, which can also coincide with times of peaker power plants that are the dirtiest power plants. So I think that there's a lot that we can do, but simply providing added total annual electrons is probably not part of it. Okay, so you see it, you see the solutions more in the storage side as opposed to the generation side. I think that was a really in interesting- And insight. curtailment. And curtail, yeah. right. Curtailing demand. Of course, so how would we go about working with the utility companies to secure storage resources for our area? Well, I think Chris is probably the one best answer to this, but this is about the type of company that's managing your community choice aggregation. And among the resources they can purchase is storage. Okay. Uh, yeah, how, how could we go about working towards that? It's going to depend on what the DPU allows us to do as far as community choice aggregation goes. I'm going to point out we are after, we are after six, and it's a very complicated topic. <laughs> All right, well, this is a great ending then. So um, and I think this will be a big part of your agenda, not just this item, but the whole, um, you know, prioritizing the high impact things at the February meeting. So with that, I will end us and let us adjourn on time. Thank you all so much. Enjoy your vacation.